All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, 1778, it's the first statewide legislative referendum in the United States, which took place in Massachusetts. And I want to give you listeners a little bit of context for why we're doing this first right off the bat. As you may know, in the run up to the midterm election, which is just a few weeks away, we are going to do a number of episodes that are historical. Yes, but maybe also give us some perspective or something to think about as we watch this year's election play out. So we're going to do a full week on our favorite midterm stories and a full week on our favorite stories about polling. And this, folks, is the first episode of Referendums Week, uh, which we really like to lead with the most exciting, salacious stuff at first. And I just know, like, people are running to their radios to turn up the volume when they hear Referendums Week, a whole week about referendums and ballot initiatives. Um, But for real, we are excited to do this in no small part because, look, this election has focused us on how broken our democracy can feel. And it is maybe... One way to start unbreaking it is through these moments of direct democracy, these referendums, these ballot initiatives, when the people vote directly on things as opposed to voting for representatives who then vote on things. So that's a lot of table setting, I know. Um, Let me introduce our guest who's going to sit at this table uh, for these next two episodes, Joshua Graham Lynn, CEO of the group Represent Us, who are an anti-corruption, pro-democracy, nonpartisan grassroots organization. They've worked on a bunch of referendums and initiatives. They know how this stuff works So, Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I'm so excited to talk about referendums. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, if anyone's going to do it, it's you. Um, And one thing we should say is that maybe listeners have heard us talk about how this show and a bunch of other shows are part of this pro-democracy podcast coalition. We'll talk about that in a minute, but our partners on that are Represent Us, and we're trying to do things and help our listeners do things to sort of help protect our democracy, which is really what we're talking about here. So we'll talk about that in a sec, but first we have to get into the history And here are our actual historians, Nicole Hemmer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. So, uh, yeah, this episode we're going to do kind of, you know, an overview of the world of referendums and hear from Josh about kind of how we um, how we should think of them. But uh, let's talk about 1778 first in Massachusetts. Josh, you're in Massachusetts. Is this um, something when you're just walking around, everyone's just buzzing about the, f- the fact that Massachusetts was the first state to have a statewide referendum? I guarantee if you go to any bar in the state of Massachusetts, anywhere in Boston too, it's the only thing people talk about. It's just like, what happened in the last ballot initiative? Do you remember that time in 1778? It's talk of the town. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> used to be called referendum donuts. It's a little oh. known fact. <laughs> America runs on ballot Facts. initiatives. Yeah. Um, America does run on ballot initiatives. So. I know. Gosh, I was setting you up. Um, wait, actually, I have a, a question uh, right off the bat. What is the dif- distinction between a referendum, a ballot initiative, a proposition? Are they all kind of interchangeable? Or Oh, that's a tricky question. So, look, some of them are referred from the legislature. So if you have a legislature who's trying to figure something out, they can't decide or it's contentious or they think the voters will love it and they just want to be sure and they want to gain some points, sometimes legislators will refer things to the ballot and make it a referendum. Um, Sometimes it is a ballot initiative that is proposed by the voters where they collect a bunch of signatures. I'm sure you've seen this on the street. If you're walking around outside the grocery store, somebody says, hey, you know, do you care about X? We're trying to put it on the ballot. We're going to vote on it this November. 
Um, but as to the linguistic distinction between the two, I got to be honest, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's largely the same, which is just voters voting directly on uh, legislation as opposed to um, legislators doing that. Um, this one was the voters of Massachusetts in 1778 voting on something that had already happened, kind of giving it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And that thing that had already happened was a constitution. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kelly, uh, Nikki, what did the voters say when they were uh, faced with the option of approving or not approving the state constitution in 1778? I mean, they rejected it. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, actually, no, we don't really agree with this constitution. <laughs> and I mean, you know, I get it. For for a number of reasons, I think some of their concerns were, were valid. You know, they worried that the governor would have a little bit too much power. They worried that there was not a Bill of Rights attached to it. They worried, um, you know, about making sure all of their their needs as a state were being met. And so, um, no, it, it actually took a while to pass. And they were concerned about particular types of protection from Mm -hmm. people who had power, the Bill of Rights to protect minority rights, um, the separation of powers so that the legislature, the governor, the judges wouldn't become too strong. Um, So they really were invested in making sure that this constitution um, protected rights, which is a, a good reason to vote a constitution down if you don't think it does that. Yeah. Um. It does strike me, though, and Josh, I'm sure this is something you encounter all the time, you know, but like if the referendum is on this constitution, I mean, the constitution is then full of so many clauses that have so many possible effects and so and are probably sort of inscrutable in so many ways that and I think people feel this, too, sometimes when they walk in and they're faced with a referendum or it's a moment to vote on something. You know, what am I actually voting on here? This feels like a mishmash. I'm voting on a bunch of things. Maybe I agree with this. Maybe I disagree with this. And so, like. Is this going back to the very first statewide referendum, an example of something that's just like, there's too much, there's too much going on here to process in one up or down vote? I think it's a great example of one of the truisms you've heard a million times, which is that democracy is imperfect, right? And legislating is imperfect and ballot initiatives are imperfect and the process is imperfect. But ultimately, it comes down to a question of like, do you believe that voters or people, even if they're not voters, should have the right and ability to vote on things that become law and whether or not all those people get together in a room and draft it together, which would be like the most direct democracy, or whether there's a group of thought leaders who put something together and propose it, I think is less important than just the idea that we all have a bit of direct agency on like, do I want that to be a law here, even if it's imperfect, because we're never going to all get exactly what we want. And there's a real question at the heart of this, which is a question of legitimacy, Um, Do you Mm. consider this constitution legitimate if only the representatives vote on it? Do you consider it more legitimate if the people get to vote on it? And and we should say we're talking about a very circumscribed group of people who are invited to vote on this. Um, Basically all white men. (laughs) No one else. (laughs) Um, But within that um, very circumscribed electorate, um, does it feel like people had a voice in the process of setting up the very core structure of their government? I mean, aside from the fact that it was probably a big group of a bigger group of white men telling a smaller group of white men that, you know, what they did was not the right thing. I mean, it's better than having those 250 who first gathered just make the decision unilaterally. Right. There's a little bit of Mm -hmm. check and balance again, far from perfect. In fact, really troubled. But yeah, I think it's a great question that you asked. And the answer is yes, there was some pushback. There was some accountability. And that's a really good thing. Yeah, I think it forces people to have to grapple, too, with like, what what are the possible consequences or what are the possible fallout of some of these laws that get implemented? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes you can't foresee some of those things, but to have people um, either trying to say no to the process or even slowing down the process to be able to think things through more, I think is is really valid. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting, you know, as we as we think about the the sort of directness of democracy and the mediation of democracy. I mean, the result of the rejection of this constitution was not then, okay, every citizen of Massachusetts gets to write this new constitution together. It was a constitutional convention where there were 250 people who then assigned another 30 people to then write the thing and then bring it back, you know. So then sort of interestingly led to indirect democracy. But I suppose, and, and and Josh, I suppose this is the fallout of a lot of ballot initiatives, it 
it sends a clear message about who you are accountable to. So even if there's still at the end of the day, 30 people in a room, they're sort of sitting in that room knowing that they got there because the people said something to say. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I think one of the things that we as a country just forget, and I don't know why we forget this, but we have the whole of, by, and for the people thing, right? We all know it. And yet at the end of the day, most people look at government as an over there thing. Like, it's like, it's like, oh yeah, that's government and I hate it. And it's like, it's that other thing, but like, it's us, it's, it's literally your neighbors. And it's like the person who used to be a librarian and it's, it's real people who have decided to go run for office and get elected and become government, but that doesn't make them not us anymore. And I think if we remember that, it adds to that accountability you were just talking about. And it's so important to keep reinforcing that, that this is ours. It is our government. We make the choices ultimately, uh, even if we get disconnected from it. I, I was going to say, there's something about, I think, Massachusetts too, that is sort of representative of the country in a way, in that it flip-flops a lot. Like when you think about how slavery gets created in 1641, Massachusetts is the first country to really sanction, legally sanction the institution of slavery. And then they're the first state to abolish the institution of slavery within their state in 1783. And then you see, you know, they become the first state to like legalize, you know, in segregation. And then some of that gets rolled back. But like you get to see how progress has sort of like ups and downs and backs and forwards. And so it's not just this straight line that people are constantly thinking and rethinking a lot of these big ideas that we might think um, is very simple, you know, is actually not. And it does take a lot to sort of work out these ideas that um, that we all live our lives in. Mm -hmm. And the referenda and initiative process is part of that. It, it comes out of this moment in the late 19th century where a lot of Americans felt like the process of government really was too far away from them and that there were too many powerful and wealthy people who were controlling the process and not enough ordinary people who were controlling the process, which leads to the populist movement. And one of the big things that the populist movement called for, they called for a few really important things. They called for a secret ballot. And they called for these referenda and initiatives in order to be able to have more of a voice in a legislature that they felt they didn't have enough of, of a voice in. And then, of course, they also called for the 17th Amendment, which led to the direct election of senators rather than having state legislators um, uh, state legislators select them. And it would ultimately be the progressive movement that turns those ideas into law. But it is a big moment of change and a big push for more representative democracy in that moment. I just want to pick up on one thing that you said, because I know you were talking about the 1790s, but listening to you, it was like Americans all across the country feel like there's too much money in the system and there, you know, people who have wealth and access and power have all the power and average mm -hmm. Americans don't have enough. Like that could be 2022. <laughs> <laughs> like it's line. just, it's exactly, <laughs> it is. Line. And so- well yeah. And and I mean that walk through history is kind of what I what I want to start doing now because I do think the appetite for direct democracy really does track along the ways that you're discussing Josh. And like, you know, I think that Massachusetts says this thing in the 1770s and uh, and and as a sort of leader on some of this Nikki mentioned the progressive era that does seem to be a moment in which a lot of these reforms go into place, you know, the 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 mechanics of direct democracy change and then the use of it also sort of kicks into high gear including some stuff like i think these are all massachusetts but in 1920 they defined cider and beer as non-intoxicating liquors to then get out of prohibition they ended Listen, up that's important that's important <laughs> the people, that's the no surprise the people right that there. massachusetts was a leader there <laughs> right. this is the best one in 1928 they ended a ban on sporting events on sundays which now we're like that's the day for sports that apparently was not the case um and then you know they repealed prohibition they changed they reformed candidate nominating procedures this is all like in the 20s and 30s so it's clearly in the progressive era there is just some we've talked about it on the show in the progressive era there was there was an understanding and and concerted thought about the gears of democracy and the levers of democracy in a way that feels very resonant now too where people are actually talking about kind of what are the mechanisms by which our democracy actually plays out and it's so interesting to think about where this is going to end up to josh's point which is there does seem to be so much frustration in the system right now. And I don't know how you feel, Kelly, but as a historian, I'm like, 
is it going to happen? Is now when it's going to happen? Is it going to explode? And there's going to be like constitutional amendments all of a sudden and all of these new ways of um, dealing with all of these counter majoritarian institutions that people are really frustrated with right now. And could be. I mean, we'll see what happens. But yeah. it, um, it feels like the energy is there in this moment. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I think we've seen, you know, there is sort of like a Simon Says, I think, with certain laws. Like if you think about how marijuana has changed and how like at first these states uh, that that allowed marijuana use, recreational use of marijuana were like sort of frightened, sort of like your 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 small states that didn't have a lot of diverse populations. And now it's become so prevalent across the country um, that it might, it hasn't yet, but it might become federal law that these things get changed. But um, it does, I think it is interesting to see like how the culture and policy sort of like shape shift and move across the country. And something that was like completely off the table before is now like just a part of the way that we live our lives. Kelly, you were speaking to something that actually is like a common repeatable pattern throughout American history, which is that whether it's ballot initiative or legislative, states passing laws and changing laws throughout history has ultimately led to federal change. And it goes, we've talked about a bunch of them, but like prohibition, same thing happened, both making it, you know, making it happen and then <laughs> taking sex. it away and putting it back. <laughs> um, same thing with uh, marriage equality for same sex couples, same well, things yeah. with interracial yeah. marriage. These were all led yeah. by the states. And so I think it creates a really powerful model if you want to know how do we fix our broken democracy right now. It's like yeah. start in the yeah. states, get it done, keep fighting for it, and change culture while you're at it. So, but I mean, it's a double-edged sword because think about abortion. Do you know what I mean? Like, think about things that aren't necessarily that great. Like the the how things change um, is not always forward, right? And depending on not always straightforward, maybe. Yeah, right. yeah, right. Yes, right. And I want to <laughs> yes. talk about. I, I definitely want to get to this moment, and I will add. You know, I mean, abortion is interesting because of that. You know, I would say like, other than. I mean, the clarion call in many ways around the, the abortion in this this in this moment was Kansas voters putting their foot down and saying this is this is a bridge too far. This is going too far. And so they're really you know, that was a sort of striking moment in the way that we're describing one more historical thing. And then let's come to the to the present. I am fascinated by these sort of moments of referendum fever or whatever. And that was actually the name of an article in 1979 in The Atlantic. It was referendum fever, which we found is very fascinating. It was looking at like, why that, you know, we are in this moment. And I think the 70s is another moment where, especially in, in a state like California, where there was just a ton of ballot initiatives and referendums. And so, Josh, do you have a sense of why in the 70s, this popped back up. And then in particular, I think people associate California so much with this. And is it, and just sort of, can you try and explain why California and some other states seem to be like the ones that are always having these sort of really attention grabbing referendums? So there are definitely states that lean on the referendum process more than others. And I think it comes down to state culture. Um, a surprising one is South Dakota, which was one of the first states to use the referendum process. I think they're the oldest standing referendum process mm -hmm. in the country. Yep. And I think what it comes down to is citizens um, using it, recognizing the power, and then bringing it back again, which again is not always towards the positive. Sometimes negative things get through, but ultimately I think it's the pattern of using it and reusing it. Um, I can't imagine in the seventies that it was anything other than what got talked about before, which is that there was just this feeling of things changing, right? We really think of the seventies as a big time of transformation and what a powerful tool in direct democracy to make transformation happen when it has been culturalized. Cause you're not dependent on just like 12 elected leaders or 400 elected leaders, you're dependent on the population and the way they all feel about something. And it was an era of that was really focused on reform, especially in the aftermath of Watergate, this idea that the government needed some reforms and that initiatives and referenda could be a good tool for um, pushing back against potentially corrupt legislators. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and we're going to do an episode and a couple episodes about Prop 13, which I think in, in California, which was a sort of anti-tax referendum, which I think has Californians are still living in the in the wake of that. And, I, you know, I want to point out that there's been a lot of propositions that have pushed in conservative directions and uh, progressive directions. And, you know, I think that it's part of the, the messiness of the will of the people. Um, Josh, to sort of bridge us to now, I want to read you a quote from that um, Atlantic article, 1979, titled Referendum Fever. But it says... 
Because of its sporadic remedial use and because it does not exist at the national level, we have never fully assimilated direct democracy into our political consciousness. And I'm curious if you kind of have a, a, a reaction to that. Does it have a place in our political consciousness? I mean, if it's on a podcast, it's clearly yes. part <laughs> of our... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, it's not for me just the, like, is the ballot initiative process part of our consciousness. It's about, do we recognize as a people that we can use this tool that we have to shape our democracy the way we want it to be? And so to bridge to now, some of the things that represent us has been a part of, and our members across the country have been a part of, are things like passing laws to crack down on gerrymandering within a state. Passing laws to make more transparency within state and federal government, passing ethics reforms, passing anti-corruption reforms, changing the way that our campaigns are financed and the rules are implemented, things like ranked choice voting have passed by a ballot initiative. And so once you learn the things that are possible to pass, I think it makes the tool that much more appealing and starts to become something that people want to use and want to be part of. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you, there's direct democracy to pass a particular piece of legislation. There's de direct democracy to fix democracy. But I mentioned this in the intro that maybe the answer to trying to, you know, unscrew our democracy is in these sort of very tactical initiatives and, and referendums. And it sounds like you kind of see some hope there. Absolutely. I mean, counting all of our victories together, and this is the movement, this is thousands and millions of people across the country working in concert, we've had 160 victories in 10 years. Now, not all of those are ballot initiatives, probably 30, 35 of them are ballot initiatives, but uh, the idea that we can't fix anything is actually wrong. Like we actually really can fix things and it keeps happening. And what will make it happen faster is more people being involved and more effort getting put into it and more momentum happening. Because I think like was said a minute ago, there's this, uh, what'd you, it wasn't like monkey see, monkey do, but it was like one state passes. Simon says. Simon says. says Thank you. You know, it was like yeah, a yeah. kid's yeah. game. Yeah, it was like Twister. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's this idea that once you see the power of change in a state, you want that for your own state. And I'd love to give you one example mm -hmm. that just happened really recently, which yeah. was uh, the recent special election in Alaska. And right. the outcome, as I think many of us know, was that you saw Alaska elect their first female, first native representative. What an amazing thing. And the ranked choice voting process that was put in place there happened through ballot initiative. It was totally transformative. They used nonpartisan primaries, moving folks from the primaries to the general. And what was amazing was that you had two Republicans able to run in the general election without stealing votes from each other. And then when all of the sort of first choice and second choice votes were counted, we found out that people who had supported Begich, which was the other Republican who ran against Palin, half of them, almost half of them, supported Peltola as their second choice because we're complicated human beings, right? <laughs> like not everybody just sees everything through labels. And so it was a really powerful outcome and a really fantastic uh, example of how now one state is doing it differently and other states are following. And I think for people who feel sort of trapped by the two-party system, that's a really great example of how they can express a broader range of their politics through something mm -hmm. like ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just, I would be so remiss if I didn't say it, but it's on the ballot in Nevada this year as well, that combination of nonpartisan primaries and ranked choice voting. And people are excited about it because they saw what happened in right. Alaska. Yeah. yeah. So as we wrap up, I mean, I did mention that this podcast and a number of other podcasts and you know i'm i'm one of the sort of organizers of this initiative um is part of what we're calling the pro-democracy podcast coalition which is a bunch of radiotopia shows are doing a bunch of other shows are doing a pushkin shows and basketball podcasts and culture podcasts and not just politics podcasts it's a bunch of people in the podcast community who believe what josh is expressing here that there are ways to sort of put one foot in front of the other and try and, you know, protect our democracy, which we recognize is um, under threat right now. And so um, I want to just say thanks for partnering with us on this. And, you know, to reiterate, like, there are things you can do right now, right? And I will say the website so Josh doesn't have to, but it's represent.us, represent.us slash pod. You go there, but like, there's ways to support the, that initiative in Nevada. There's ways to sign up to be a poll worker. Just talk a little bit about like, because so much of this is 
is the helplessness or the feeling that, oh, it's too big. And there are things right in front of our nose right now that we can do. Yeah. Well, thank you for being part of the coalition and really leading that. It's amazing. Uh, and thanks for saying the URL as well, which I think was represent.us slash POD. Oh, yeah. There, I said it too. Um, so look, what can people do? There's a couple things. If you want to just sign up on a website, get informed, that's great. If you can pitch in a couple bucks a month, then you get to be part of every victory that happens. And that's amazing. If you live somewhere where there's an initiative happening right now or something being planned for future years, then we can connect you with the people in that state who are working on those initiatives. And I'm using the term initiative broadly, trying to get something done. And so no matter what level you feel like participating in, there's a way to do it. And I think that's the key message here is like, do get involved, actually do put one foot in front of the other. And it starts with just literally signing up on a website to start collecting information because you might not even know what's happening in your neck of the woods. There are seven really important campaigns happening just this year. There's a half a dozen to a dozen more planned for next year and beyond. So check it out. Yeah. Excellent. Can I just make a pitch? Because yeah. my parents are poll workers and they absolutely love it. And, my dad and is doing incur- it too. It's a great, great <laughs> retirement. <laughs> it's great. It's great. A lot of senior citizens do it, but I would encourage even more absolutely. younger people to get involved. And remember, if you, it's gratifying. if you don't do it, someone else is going to. Right. And yeah. it, it better be you instead. No, that way you're supposed to. And remember, if you do it, you'll probably get free coffee if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and donuts, and maybe donuts. donuts. Yeah. <laughs> Referendum <laughs> donuts, which <laughs> is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, you brought it all all the way around. Nick. Full nice. circle like a donut. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thanks, Jody. Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. And Joshua Graham Lynn of Represent Us. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. You're going to come back for one more episode. And you did mention the Dakotas. We're going to go to North Dakota and talk about the badass grandmas who did a uh, really fascinating story. We're going to do that next episode. So we'll see you then. But thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. Radiotopia.